Good evening, everybody. I'm Jessica Strand, the Director of Public Programming at the Library Foundation. Um, before we begin the program, in the spirit of reconciliation, the Los Angeles Public Library recognizes and acknowledges the First Peoples of this land. We pay our respect to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all indigenous peoples today. Um, so I already introduced myself, but I'm the Director of Public Programs at the Library Foundation, and it's wonderful to see you all here. There's nearly a full house. Um, we are now in the midst of our spring programming. In the weeks ahead, we'll have Cheryl Strayed, uh, Peter, and I'm going to somehow butcher his last name, Willibin, who's the author of The Groundbreaking, The Hidden Life of Trees with Sandra Singlo, and Mayor Bass and David Ambrose. These are just a few of the names of those who will be joining us. So please check lfla.org backslash allow to see our full spring lineup. We'd love to see you there. For those not familiar with the Library Foundation of Los Angeles, we are a private nonprofit organization devoted to fundraising, advocacy, and innovative programming in the support of the Los Angeles Public Library. Thank you to so many uh, Library Foundation members who are here this evening. If you are not yet a member, I hope that you will join uh, to continue to see more programs like this one and to support critical library services and initiatives for children, teens, and adults all over Los Angeles, helping them to improve their lives and achieve their dreams. Now for tonight's program. I'm excited and honored to introduce these two remarkable writers, Emily St. John Mandel and Charles Yu. When thinking about Mandel's work, one can't help but reflect on the ease with which she moves back and forth in time, her ability to occupy the ordinary, to beautifully describe the landscapes of our future, to finally mine her character's emotional state, whether it be sadness or loneliness. There are no gimmicks here. It's her precise and beautiful use of language that beckons you to read more. Here's a terrific quote from the New York Times about her latest novel, The Sea of Tranquility. It begins with a quote from the book. Quote, what was it like to leave Earth, a rapid ascent over the green and blue world? Then the world was blotted out all at once by clouds, the atmosphere turned thin and blue, the blue shaded into indigo, and then it was like a slipping through the skin of a bubble. There was black, there was black space. The New York Times comments, that feeling of something lovely being glimpsed and lost everywhere in these pages, which makes sense considering that the exiles, grieving friends, lonely authors, and lonelier time travels, Mandel sets in motion in this luminous follow-up to Station Eleven and the Glass Hotel, are all trying with varying degrees of success to catch hold of what keeps eluding them, and whether there's something they've had and lost, or something they want but can't quite name, all feel adrift on the boundless seas of longing. Emily St. John Mendel's five previous novels include The Glass Hotel, which has been translated into 25 languages, and Station Eleven, which was a finalist for the National Book Award and the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction was the basis of a limited series on HBO Max and has been translated into 37 languages. Charles Yu is the author of four books, including his latest Interior Chinatown, which won the 2020 National Book Award for Fiction and was shortlisted for the Le Prix, I'm gonna butcher this, uh, Medici Entranger and long listed for the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction. He has received the National Book Foundation's Five Under 35 Award and been nominated for two Writers Guild Awards for his work on HBO series Westworld. Please put your hands together and welcome Emily St. Mindell and Charles Yu. Hello. 
Hello. <laughs> um, I have a cold, and it's not COVID. I just want to get that out of the way to start out with. Um, I tested three times. It's it's just a cold, but yeah, I uh, I might lose my voice and or have a coughing fit. Don't be alarmed. Um, I like to open with a pandemic. Yes, yeah. Right. So remain <laughs> calm. Kind of uh, nothing to worry about. Yeah. Uh, welcome. Hi, everyone. Very excited to be here with uh, Emily St. John Mandel. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, Charlie is one of my favorite novelists. That's, and it's, it's, um, it's an honor to be interviewed by you, so thank you. Oh, wow. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to blush a little. <laughs> I'm quite starstruck. I, uh, Emily St. John Mandel is very, uh, everyone here knows who she is. Obviously, you're here for her. Um, and uh, it's, it's surreal to be sitting here next to you. Um, uh, I'm a huge fan of yours. I also, this is the first time we've met in person. Yeah, we Zoomed. What, yeah, like Zoomed. nine months or 10 months ago or, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, it's, it's lovely to, to actually see you. Yeah, I, I made the slow approach through layers of reality. <laughs> like Twitter, mm -hmm. Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Now here. Library, <laughs> yeah. Helping. <laughs> personal friendship at some mm -hmm. point. Absolutely. Maybe. Yeah, I'm in. Um, <laughs> but yeah, one step at a time. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll see how the conversation, no <laughs> pressure. <laughs> I'm literally blushing now, but uh, the lights don't help. I think, um, yeah, you are in person. I feel like there's a, I don't know, it's probably dumb to say, but some people you're like, oh, that's interesting. That person writes that prose. You seem to be someone who actually fits the, like, you were like the embodiment of the elegant, striking prose of your novels. Well, thank but, you. I appreciate that. Uh, Thanks. Um, That's nice. And uh, we are here to talk about this amazing book, among other things. Um, that amazing book. Um, do you, I guess the first question is, um, are we living in a simulation? I, I don't know. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. So just to provide context, because I assume a lot of you have read the book. I also assume a lot of you are the significant others of people who have read the book, <laughs> which is okay. Like, you don't have to read it. But um, so the, the book is partly concerned with the simulation hypothesis, which is what it sounds like, this idea that all of this is a simulation. And that was just something I came across years ago on some, like, 1 a.m. internet rabbit hole. Uh, you know, that's where I end up. Um, and what I love about the idea is that you can find really, really smart people to very convincingly argue either side of the question. Um, what I came to in writing this book was thinking, A, I don't know, but B, I'm not sure it matters that much. Where, you know, it's like, if conclusive proof were to appear tomorrow that all of this is a simulation, I don't think that would make our lives matter less. Because like something I found myself thinking about in writing this is, what is a simulation? Uh, like, uh, the way I was thinking about it is, okay, if you're living in a city on the moon, which some of the action in this book takes place in moon colonies in the year 2401, that is an incredibly simulated environment in terms of the way you experience gravity, the, what your atmosphere is like, water, like all the rest of it. Does that mean your life is less real than your life is living in Los Angeles in 2023? I don't think it does. It's just kind of a different kind of simulation. Now you take that a step further. You know, I grew up in a really rural place when I was a kid. Um, water came from like a creek behind the house. And so I think, well, in many ways, the life that I live in cities now is sort of simulated in a way compared to that in terms of the ease of things like water. Um, does that mean my life is more real in the country than it is in the city? It's like, of course not. That would be crazy. So I think if you just take that idea one step for, further, I think it doesn't matter that much whether we're living in a simulation or not. I, I think that's such a fascinating um, way to think about simulation. You know, people, I think about the Matrix, or you think about um, a very specific kind of, I think, science fictional or scientific sense of simulation. Um, and instead, what I feel like you're talking about, to me anyway, is a sense of reality versus unreality. 
Yeah, I think that's fair to say, which is something I love about your work too, by the way, you know, the way you touch on that idea. Um, we were talking a minute ago in the green room about land acknowledgements, which have been a thing in Canada where I'm from for a very, very, very long time. But I feel like I've just recently begun to hear them in the US. This book opens with an immigrant from the UK in 1912 coming across to Canada. And he's very loosely based on a great grandfather of mine who had that, that experience. And you know, if you think about the tragedy of colonialism, like the bloodbath that that actually was, that had a lot to do with people living in a wrong idea. And uh, that idea varied country by country. In Canada, it was the myth of the empty land, this idea that here was a vast territory just there for the taking. It wasn't empty, and that's, that's where the tragedy arose. There were people living there. Um, if you're immigrating in the service of a terrible idea, if you're living within a wrong idea, is that not also a kind of simulation in a weird way? So yeah, I just found that, I yeah, that idea of reality versus unreality um, kind of touches on every part of this book, I would say. I, I want to return to that, but I have to take a tiny detour. The character you're talking about, who's based on your great-grandfather, is descended, f described as being descended from William the Conqueror. Does that mean you are descended from? Uh, yeah, yeah. I have like, a, there's this one branch of the family with like really fancy ancestors. Um, everybody else, like not so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know my fancy ones, but um, do um, and. It's so it's in, I don't know, is it in his blood? Is it in everyone's blood to be Maybe. a colonizer, to I, be an explorer? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's definitely in everybody's blood to fall prey to terrible ideas. You know, that feels like something that transcends genealogies. <laughs> yeah, you know, where humans are flawed. Um, I, I do think we can fall prey to, to terrible ideas quite easily. And these characters... Um, well, the first part of the novel, I don't want to jump too far ahead, starts with a kind of westward migration. And I think what's, to, to me, interesting is in the course of the book, you describe basically migrations or excursions in all three spatial directions. I, I, I describe as west, north, and up, right? Out <laughs> right, yeah. Into yeah. space. And then through, I don't know if it's a spoiler, but through time, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, I guess that's not a spoiler. Um, um, and, and so I just thought that the scope of that was fascinating. How do you uh, come about, how, how, how do you construct something like this? How did this come together, I guess? Uh, you know, I think this book is a product of a very specific historical moment, which is, I started writing it in March 2020 in New York City. And like, yeah, I mean, if the book's a little crazy, it's because what we were What was happening right then? Uh, I yeah, I mean, it. like, I know, I know. It's all a blur, candidly. There was a lot of Zoom meetings. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, it was just an absolutely god-awful time um, everywhere. But, you know, that was kind of an epicenter moment there. It was an atmosphere of constant ambulance sirens. Um, there's something about the scale of travel in the book that I think comes out of lockdown, honestly. Where, you know, like, you, you remember that period when you weren't really supposed to leave your neighborhood, basically. Um, there was a really long period, like three weeks, where I didn't venture you know, beyond this very small geographical territory, and I didn't travel for a long time. And yeah, there was something about being sort of forcibly constrained that I think made me want to set the book as far away from my apartment as humanly possible. Like anywhere on Earth was too close. I was going to the moon. So yeah, so lunar colonies was, uh, was part of the solution, but also, I feel like there was something about how horrible that time was in early 2020 that gave me a feeling of like a kind of creative recklessness where I wrote a book that I might not have written at a different time. Just this feeling like, you know what, everything's terrible. I'm going to write a book about a time traveling detective. Like that seems fun, you know, um, because nothing else was fun. It was a really hard time. So yeah, that's, that's how you end up with a novel about a time-traveling detective that moves through time and space and, and is set in moon colonies. Yeah, <laughs> that's, um, you, you, you wrote a novel about a time-traveling detective um, set in moon colonies. I think you also, and tell me if this is me projecting, but in a way created um, 
the Emily St. John Mandel Extended Universe. Um, you have elements that uh, you have a kind of proxy character that I would say mm -hmm. seems like the author. Um, there's a reference to uh, characters from other novels, um, or not reference, but y y to me there's something about, and this is where my hypothesis is, like for me that like a little game is just trying to imagine either the first sentence where the author was like, now I know the book, or like the way in, I guess, in general. And this might just be in retrospect, but I, I have a, I, I, the way I'm thinking about this book is there's something interesting about the, the recklessness you're talking about and, and the detachment from reality during 2020 and saying, I'm not just gonna write my next novel, I'm gonna write the novel that like, if I were to go up above right. <laughs> time and write a novel about all my novels in a way or just sort yeah. of leave the timeline. Yeah, that makes um, sense. It's almost like a meta novel about <laughs> about writing novels. About I writing know. Novels. Yeah, which like you don't want to make a habit of that as a novelist. You know, you'll it's just something kind I of have, like eating but your yes, right, so you don't right. want to do that. You don't want to do it for like book after book after book. Um, yeah, there is something a little bit meta there, and that was actually the starting point for Sea of Tranquility. So I had an epic promotional tour for Station Eleven. I did a hundred and twenty-seven events in seven countries over fourteen months. Which I don't actually recommend, but I got to I got to uh, I got to travel to some cool places and talk to really interesting people. Um, I would say that I mean I really like doing events. Um, I would say that 99% of the interactions that I have with people at an event are fantastic. It's it's really it's a privilege and it's wonderful to get to do this. If you do 127 events, um, I'm just gonna say like that one percent adds up. So, you know, like 99% of the time it's great, but there is another percentage point there. Um, so I'd had a number of really strange experiences on the road. Um, strange is doing a lot of heavy lifting in that sentence. I think I just mean sexist, actually. That, yeah, just like bizarre and kind of sexist and weird. Um, and I keep a journal, so I had a verbatim record of all of them. Um, <laughs> hey, that's, that's just how I roll. I hold grudges. Um, so I, uh, you know... And I really like autofiction as a form. I really admire Rachel Kosk's work, for example. So about, I wanna say about three months before the pandemic, I'd started working on these autofiction fragments about an author on tour. And I think I maybe just wanted to get it out of my system. I wasn't sure I'd ever publish it, but I wanted to write about the strangeness of the prolonged tour and what those interactions were. Um, and then the pandemic hit and I decided to write this time travel novel. Mm. So then I had to pick the timelines. So there's the 1912 timeline, because that moment interests me. Um, February 2020 in New York City, which is where those overlapping characters come in, because I had just published The Glass Hotel in March 2020. And I realized I had these characters who I'd just written and were really fresh in my mind and really interesting and vivid to me, just kind of waiting in the wings who I could bring in for, for February 2020. And then I thought, maybe it would be kind of interesting to take that book tour and put it through a science fictional lens, and it's in the year 2302, I think. Um, but it's funny, you know, it's, I, I could, you can easily call those sections autofiction. On the other hand, I left out so much of my life that it doesn't, I don't feel really more exposed by those sections than I do by, by other characters I've written over the years. Yeah. Um. Do you, one thing you also write about that you, I don't know if, if it's ex, feel exposed or autobiographical is um, parenting, I yeah. guess. Yeah, yeah, there is there's some autobiography in those sections with parenting too. Um, my protagonist has a daughter who has a different name than my real daughter, but is exactly the same age. My daughter had just turned four when the pandemic hit and you know, I pulled her out of preschool and then no more childcare, which you know, as I'm sure you experienced, made writing extremely difficult for a very long time. <laughs> um, it made everything difficult. Um, yeah, just seeing the way a small child processed not being able to go to school and the isolation of those early months, that was really hard to watch. And it was something I put into the book. So there is a moment in the book where the five-year-old says, can we pretend the seltzer bottle is my friend? Can you make it talk to me? And I did that in real life. 
I've said, hi, says the seltzer bottle. You know, like you, yeah, the, these things that you have to do. Um, which is also, by the way, where the title of the book comes from, which is, you know, our job as parents in those early days. Um, your kids are a bit older than my daughter, but, you know, maybe especially when your kids were young enough to not fully understand what was happening. Our job was to create a kind of magical, safe, peaceful world while homeschooling and holding out a job, which was basically impossible. But the job was to create calm and peace in the chaos, no matter how old our kids were. And that, to me, was one of the weird revelations of life in the early pandemic, was that life can be tranquil in the face of death. That was such a bad time in New York and everywhere. I do think I succeeded in creating a calm little bubble for her. So yeah, that was where the title came from. It's, it's extremely dark. We were, we were living in kind of a sea of tranquility. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, it, there's, you describe so well in the book in multiple passages, just the experience of um, both the acknowledgement or understanding of the extreme privilege to be able to have that bubble of calm and yet that doesn't, uh, you know, in the moment with your child when you're realizing that your child's friend is a seltzer bottle, you know, and <laughs> yeah. you have to... It doesn't feel great. Be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> become the world for your child, and yeah. that's a sort of mini civilization that you're creating, right. essentially, and that yeah. I feel like that wraps up in so many ways themes that you've touched on in multiple novels of yours is uh, either civilization ending <laughs> or right. rebuilding yeah. itself um, in small ways. I mean say Station Eleven, obviously, or, mm -hmm. or here in this book. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Um, yeah, I mean, a world is always kind of disappearing. We're like, you know, the world of our childhoods is long gone. And there's no grand cataclysm that ended it, but it's gone. You know, let alone the world of 100 years ago. It's, it's interesting to me to think that way, that, yeah, just this idea that a world is always kind of falling away and a new world is always taking its place. Um. That's easy for me to say as someone who doesn't leave <laughs> Southern California very often. You went I'm envious, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you went to 127 events. I mean, you're actually seeing the world. I mean, are there highlights, lowlights, other than um, rampant sexism? Um, I guess in that time span, you obviously get to experience um, people interfacing with your work, which is also wrapped so much in this book, and I think it's so interesting to find that layer of, uh, I mean, there's people who, I, in this book, I assume this is c coming from something that happened in real life of people like tattooing their favorite lines from your work yeah, onto their that, bodies. Th there are people with survival as insufficient tattoos. Um, the first time I saw one, it, it, every, every time I see it, it's extraordinary. The first time it was actually destabilizing. As in, like, wait, that was fictional. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, how are you in my signing line with the tattoo <laughs> that I wrote in a book? Um, yeah, it's it's an unbelievable thing to see. Yeah, I can't. I mean, it's, I'm it's crazy. Waiting for someone to have one of my lines. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone wants, I mean, I can write a short sentence if you just yeah, want it. Like, yeah, he writes really elegant sentences. <laughs> like, if anyone's thinking about getting a tattoo, I feel like this is your moment. Yeah, yeah. three words. That's all. Yeah, you know, it could be. Yeah. Um, I'm going to turn to my other questions. Now, there's a, there's a passage. Um, it's short-ish. I don't, I, I don't know if you'd want to read it. I yeah, don't sure. Wanna. Happy to. Um, he never goes into the forest. Okay. Um, he never goes into the forest because he's afraid of bears and cougars. But now it holds a strange appeal. He'll step in a hundred paces, he decides, no more. Counting off a hundred paces might calm him. Counting has always calmed him. And if he walks straight for the full hundred, then surely he can't get lost. Getting lost is death. He can see that. No, this whole place is death. No, that's unfair. This place isn't death. This place is indifference. This place is utterly neutral on the question of whether he lives or dies. It doesn't care about his last name or where he went to school. It hasn't even noticed him. He feels somewhat deranged. I should have set that up a little bit. This is the son of an earl in 1912 walking into the British Columbia forest. The forest does not care where he went to school. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm sorry. I know you said you didn't want to read. That's I fine. No, I'm happy to. Sure. I, I felt like everyone should get the experience of hearing you read it because it, it's quite uh, beautiful. And I also thought that was, um, it, to me, it encapsulates so many things. I mean, the strange appeal. And I think even the counting, I think there's, and the indifference, like there's uh, multiple things within that, that that to me are, I guess, um, keywords to the Mandel universe in some ways. I don't know if that's fair or if that I sounds right. I like that. Right. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's definitely the sense of being marooned in a strange world, which, which is something I think that I got into the most clearly in Station Eleven, where... Yeah, where you have the survivors of this flu pandemic marooned in a world they couldn't possibly have imagined. And then that's mirrored by people in a comic book who are marooned in a broken space station. It might come a little bit from my having immigrated to the US as a very young adult when I was 22. And Canada is honestly not that different, which Canadians really don't like to hear that, but it's actually true. Um, <laughs> But, but it is, there is still, you know, there are still the countless small strange moments in just adapting to a slightly different, a slightly different place. Um, maybe also the experience of growing up, not in wilderness, but kind of wilderness adjacent in British Columbia. And yeah, that feeling of kind of being on the edge of this totally indifferent world that would kill you, you know, quite easily. You know, when you grow up in BC in the woods, you're just like drilled with what to do if you're lost in the woods overnight. You know, it's just this constant, mm. there's beauty and also risk. So mm. yeah, th those are interests of mine that I do find I come back to. Do you think that, uh, I mean, I guess I've always sort of idealized Canada as an American of like, it's either we're the simulation or they are you know, like one of them is like uh the, it's like an a b test of like this is what would happen if mm -hmm. you yeah, didn't yeah. have it's like this there were thing. two paths uh -huh. right <laughs> yeah. one of them had socialized medicine <laughs> you know um i had a really interesting conversation a few years ago i was interviewing another canadian novelist omar al akkad who wrote american war which is a great book by the way i really recommend it um we were talking about the way that we've experienced the United States as Canadians. We were both, we, we've both had really great careers here. You know, there's tremendous opportunity here. But he had a line that stayed with me. He said, you know, the thing about the US is there's no ceiling and there's no floor. And that to me is the major difference. You know, it's like the opportunities can feel not quite infinite, that's not the right word, but you know, the opportunities are incredible. But you can also fall much further here than you can in Canada. There's just there's just more of a safety net. So yeah, you know, it's um, I suppose which country you end up in has a lot to do with your appetite for risk. Um, that is, uh, I will I will be thinking about that for a long time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, speaking of opportunity, though, to mm -hmm. kind of take the the upside of that, um, you have made forays, big forays, into the world of uh, American TV and film. Um, do, uh, do you like that? <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I really love it. Um, yeah, I, I really do. So Station Eleven uh, was made into a, into a limited series. And a few years before that happened, or kind of in the lead up to it, because it takes forever, as you know, to bring something to screen, um, I got a call from Patrick Somerville, the showrunner, who I knew a little bit. We were both novelists a long time ago. And he said, you know, if you were interested in being a part of this, um, there, there could be a spot for you in the writer's room. And at the time, I just wasn't that interested. I was like, I'm writing this book about um, you know, white collar crime. I was like deep into the Glass Hotel. I said, you know what, I have no idea how to write a screenplay. Like, just go do your thing. Um, so, you know, they sent me a check, then they went and did their thing. Um, which is one approach that a lot of novelists take. Yeah. You know, you take the option money, and people go do this mysterious thing in Hollywood, which is totally opaque from the outside, by the way. Um, and, you know, you keep on writing books. I think we were all changed by the pandemic to some extent. Something that changed for me is... I found that after that isolation, 
I didn't just want to make stuff alone in a room anymore. So when, when kind of a similar opportunity arose to work on the Glass Hotel, I, I jumped at the opportunity. I just felt like getting to build something with other people, like that, that collaboration is really exciting to me. So yeah, I have been making forays into it. Um, I love it. It's a completely different form. I, I, think it's, I think it's fun to just learn how to do something completely different at a certain point. You know, I, I really love writing novels, and I'll always keep writing novels. Also, I've written six novels. Like, you know, doing something else has some appeal. So, yeah, I'm trying to do both. Yeah. And, I mean, just uh, for writers in the room, but also maybe just for anyone of general interest, how do you find those two things either feed each other or fight each other or both? Um, they're just so different, which I think is partly what I love. When you're writing a novel, you have, you have total control, you know, at least until your editor sees it, obviously. Um, you have total control for a very long time. Um, collaboration can feel more exhilarating in the moment. It can also feel more frustrating when the story is going in a way that you don't actually love. Um, there is also a lot of waiting in collaboration. You know, it's like you pitch something and you're waiting to hear back, or somebody else is doing this other thing in the story and you're waiting on them to do it. So during those periods, you can work on your novel and it keeps you from you know, running around in circles. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I feel like they're so different. And I think that's partly what I love about doing both. Yeah. Do you, um, what are you, are you, so you're working on adaptation and other things that are you allowed to talk about? Anymore? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm just in limbo like every other person in Hollywood. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so uh, the plan was to try to make Glass Hotel and Sea of Tranquility. Um, they were both, they're both under option by Paramount TV, which did Station Eleven. We pitched Glass Hotel to HBO Max, I want to say, yeah, several months ago. And we're just waiting to hear back. It can be a really slow process. So once that's decided, I'll know what, I'll have a better idea of what's happening with Sea of Tranquility. I'm also working on a um, feature adaptation of my first novel, Last Night in Montreal. Yeah, with uh, my friend Semi Chellis, who's uh, become a, a collaborator of mine. Um, that's been really fun. I love that project. And then I'm also working on a new novel, which um, I, I did a really long deadline on purpose because I knew I was going to be distracted by television for a while. So my deadline's not until July 2025. So it's going to be a while, but, um, but I'm working on it. I thought you were going to say 2302, because that would yeah. be my deadline. That's yeah, what absolutely. I want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's I mean, like, just give me a couple of centuries, and <laughs> I'll get it to you. I would, I would still be late on that <laughs> deadline. I, uh, right, yeah. The ghost of Charlie <laughs> yeah. finally like, handed in to Pantheon. <laughs> December 31st, 2301, I'd be like, yeah. oh my god, why did I? You're like, I'm halfway through the first draft. Why did I spend so much time on television? <laughs> yeah. YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have not run out of questions, but I also am curious if we're supposed to be starting to edge towards questions, but nobody's holding up a sign. Yes? Maybe? Okay. Okay, close. Um, you got into a fight with Wikipedia? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did get into a fight with Wikipedia. And, um, yeah, it turns out, like, if you have a Wikipedia page and you want to correct it, you're not actually the authority on your life. <laughs> like, I was surprised, but that is a thing. Um, yes, yeah, so I got divorced last year, which a lot of people did. Um, so much so, by the way, that the New York City divorce courts are backed up by, like, a year. It's crazy. Um, yeah, but anyway, I'd gotten divorced. My Wikipedia page said I was still married. Um, and that was just starting to bother me a little bit. Mm. Like it was, it's not a huge deal, or it's not hugely unexpected for a Wikipedia page to be inaccurate, because I mean, it's Wikipedia. Yeah. Um, but like, that was a little awkward for my girlfriend, was really the situation. Um, like I just thought like, if her friends look me up, that's a red flag. <laughs> like that, that, that's, not a, that's not a great look. So I was like, okay, how do I correct this? So I knew that if I just went in and edited my page, um, it would probably just get changed back. Yeah, yeah. So there is an email address where if you want to change something on a Wikipedia page, you can, um, you can email this authority and ask to do it. So I emailed this address. Um, 
I was like, can you just delete this line on my page that says I'm married? Here's a New York State divorce order, Mandel v. Mandel. Like, it was pretty straightforward. Uh, the answer was no. Um, they, uh, they, they, don't, they don't accept legal documents as a primary source. So the message was, like, I had to have it cited somewhere. And I was like, OK. Um, so I got in touch with the senior Wikipedia editor who said, you've got to give an interview. Like, you have to say in an interview that you're divorced, then Wikipedia will cite the interview. And that's how the page will get changed. That, I'm not sure that was accurate. I think just tweeting I was divorced might have been enough, but I didn't know that. I was going off his information. This was the week before Christmas. So I was like, how do I just make an interview happen and have somebody ask me if I'm still married? And I thought, Twitter. So I, um, I went on Twitter. I posted a series of tweets. And yeah, they, they culminated with, um, you know, I explained the situation. Like, I, I need a journalist to ask me if I'm still married. Um, you know, online only is fine. But yeah, I said, you know, all I want for Christmas is for a journalist to ask me if I'm, if I'm still <laughs> married. Um, it happened so quickly. It was amazing. So within like 45 minutes, I got this email from Dan Coyce at Slate. Subject header, I would totally interview you. Um, the most softball interview I've ever done in my life. I was so grateful. And one of the questions was, so, are you still married? Um, I said, no. And yeah, It probably and, seemed like a creep at the time. Like, people didn't it, know the context. Yeah, because like, like, if you didn't know the context, yeah. yeah, it was published as a totally normal interview with author Emily St. John Mandel. It's like a great title. Um, yeah, the Wikipedia article changed really fast. Um, <laughs> And then, this must have been a slow news week. The BBC picked it up. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so friends of my mom were like, so we saw on BBC News that your daughter got in a fight with Wikipedia? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah anyways, um, that, that, that's how you fix your Wikipedia entry if you get a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> so the moral of the story is create your own reality through the media. Is yes, that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. Okay, got it. Use okay. Twitter to right. bend reality. That's never gotten anyone in trouble. So never. I think no, it's we're like in what good could possibly go wrong as a civilization. Yeah. Great. Yeah, we're good. Emily St. John Mandel. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. I think we can move on to questions. Okay. Uh, together, I feel like I am living ecstatically in a science fiction universe Thank you. at this moment, not just safely. Um, <laughs> I must tell you, um, Ms. Mandel, that I personally feel responsible for the pandemic because I taught Station Eleven in my politics and the novel class, mm -hmm. and my students adored it, and within a month they were living it, Okay. and they still hold, I'd like to say me and not you, responsible. Mm -hmm. Um, and Twilight in the Altered World is actually my secret password for my email, so now everybody knows this. But <laughs> I, I have to change it anyways. USC is making me change it. But I wanted to ask about the characters moving between novels in, in, throughout your career, which I have followed since last night in Montreal, which I think Thank is you. an amazing book. Um, but the moment in The Glass Hotel when the Georgian flu doesn't happen. And we see Miranda and Leon. And I felt this, I'm a Victorian scholar, and I felt this almost Trilopian or Dickensian sense of seeing people from one book wandering into another and seeing the world changing before my eyes. I wanted to ask what it means to you to do that. And is that joyful? Is it terrifying? Do you see this as something that you'll continue to do in your fiction, and especially in the mirrored world of The Glass Hotel, which I think is just such a beautiful and brilliant book? Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, it's joyful. Uh, yeah, wh where I sometimes just become really attached to particular characters, and I just find them really interesting, and I want to write about them more. So the crossover between Station Eleven and the Glass Hotel, where you know, in the Station Eleven, I wrote Miranda. And I just really wanted to bring her back in another book, which presented a fairly formidable logistical challenge, because I did kill her off. <laughs> um, so I thought, well, 
maybe I could just lay the groundwork at the end of Station Eleven for the idea of parallel realities, which is why at the end of Station Eleven, there's a passage where Kirsten and August, in one of the post-apocalyptic chapters, are playing this game that they've been playing since childhood, where they just kind of riff on different permutations of the world. Imagine a world where X happened instead of Y. Imagine a world where the pandemic never came. And I, was, I did that because I knew I wanted to use Miranda again. So then I tried to mirror that in the early chapters of The Glass Hotel, where Vincent is wandering around Manhattan shopping. And she's kind of doing the same thing, you know, imagining a world where this had happened instead of that. Imagine a world where that terrifying new flu hadn't been quite so swiftly contained. So I wanted to lay the idea there of, of those two novels existing in kind of a parallel reality. If I'm lucky enough to, to get to make Glass Hotel as a TV series, it will be the same reality. But for the books, they're a little bit separate. And then with the characters recurring from the Glass Hotel, the Sea of Tranquility, I knew that I wanted one of the Sea of Tranquility timelines to be February 2020, because I'm obsessed with that month. The, the way I remember it in New York City, and maybe it wasn't so different here, is there was a kind of mass failure of imagination, where we're smart people. We knew what was coming. Obviously, the pandemic was arriving by the hour in our cities. Testing wasn't available, so it was possible to not understand what was happening. But it was obvious, but we didn't believe it. And I'm kind of haunted by that time, that kind of mass denialism. So I wanted to write about it. And I realized, you know, I have these characters who I just wrote for The Glass Hotel, who are very plausibly in New York City that month. But then also, one of my core values as a novelist is velocity. I really want my books to move fast with as little extraneous detail as possible. So that means I can't spend a ton of time with secondary characters, even if they're really interesting to me. And Morella in The Glass Hotel, Vincent's friend, she was really interesting to me. But she had to be sketched in kind of a minimalistic way because she wasn't a major character. So I thought, well, maybe she could be. Maybe I could bring her back and see of tranquility and spend more time with her. Yeah, so, you know, sometimes there are reasons like that. Sometimes just because it's fun. Like, I, I really recommend creating a multiverse if you're a novelist. It is, it is really fun to, like, find ways to tie all the works together. So we're going to try to go back and forth, like, split the half and half just so you know what we're doing, okay? Hi, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor to be here. I just, I'm buzzing. Um, and I didn't plan on asking a question, so forgive me if this isn't super articulate, but um, I connected like deeply to Vincent uh, because of her grief. Um, I was also named after a poet. Uh, I guess in your writing, how do you tap into that experience of grief in such a nuanced and like magical and uh, I don't, I, uh, yeah, how do, you, how do you tap into that personally? Right. I mean, I feel like we've all experienced grief. You know, nobody comes through this life unscathed and we all have these losses behind us. Um, I don't know, I, I suppose, I think that writing good fictional characters does require a kind of vulnerability that way, where I think to make them interesting and to make them feel real, you do have to tap into your own experiences. And yeah, that's just something that, um, that's something that I find myself doing when I'm writing fictional characters. So I don't know if I have a clear answer for you, except that you know, when I'm writing these people, I'm trying to make them real, and that means tapping into all the aspects of my life and experience. Hi. Uh, yeah, it's weird. Uh, March 2020 in this room was the last public event that I did for like six months. Mm -hmm. where, so I, I get that February yeah. 2020 thing for you. Uh, my question is about the dark colony and how you came up with that. What was, was that sort of like the wrong side of town or how, you know, 
could you articulate a little bit? Yeah, more sure. About that? Um, so, background for anybody who hasn't read the book. Um, they're in the in the timeline in 2401, there are three moon colonies. And one of them was built kind of hastily and cheaply, and the dome lighting failed. So there's no more simulated Earth daylight followed by night. It's just darkness, although sometimes there'll be sunlight coming out of that darkness. I was, I think when I was writing that, what I was thinking about was noir, which was kind of where I started. You know, my first three books were, were really in the noir world. I was obsessed with Raymond Chandler when I, when I started writing. And there's something about that idea of the dark city that just kind of spoke to me. Like, imagine a city where it's always night. And, you know, it's visually kind of fascinating to me. And also, there's something about that atmosphere that I just found kind of appealing for fiction. This is sort of a question more for Charles, but really for both of you. Um, it's so exciting to see the two of you together. Charles, in reading interior Chinese arguments with so many people, whether the film script was reality or was in fact a film script interwoven with this other story, and I still don't have an answer, maybe you have an answer, uh, but I also, besides you answering that, I wanted to see if, if Emily, if you have read Interior Chinatown, which I'm assuming you have. I blurbed Interior Chinatown. <laughs> That's how much I love that book. <laughs> and what you, being someone who also deals with kind of a, a fluid version of reality, what your take was on, on that. It's a question for both of you to answer. But it's your book, so you go first. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, thank you for the question. I appreciate it. Um, Emily did blurb it. I remember the day it came in. It was, you know, there's not that many joyous days in publishing, or <laughs> at least for me, but that was one of them. And it, the publisher was like, oh, okay, everything will be fine now. <laughs> this <laughs> incomprehensible book. Someone got it. And <laughs> so when it's her, then it's pretty good. So. Um, so thank you. Um, My pleasure. Uh, I don't, I, I think I have an answer. Um, and it's, I actually came from the Fox lot where we're shooting Interior Chinatown now to be at this event because of how much I respect and love Emily's work. And um, I have to answer that question on a daily basis from like <laughs> makeup, <laughs> wardrobe, you know, like it's like <laughs> it, when you write a book and I'm, this is also like words of, I don't know, Emily doesn't need this, but like as she heads in deeper into the world of like, like you have to, you like write something that's made out of air. You're like, I don't have to, you know, it's just like, it's what you want, you know, like, <laughs> and like you try to grasp it, it just, it'll elude you, but then someone's gonna take it incredibly literally 200 times a day. <laughs> and you have to answer it. And you're like, when you were thinking of this, was the carpet green or yellow? <laughs> like. I don't know, and I want to run away right now. <laughs> so I think the short answer is um, it wants to be both. It wants to be the thing, whatever, you know, don't think I'm an elephant. It wants to be like the kind of quantum slippery, like if you try to locate the particle, it's going to run away from you, you know? And I think that's what, it, it wants to live in two states at once. Like this is real and it's not, because I think that's how I live anyway, and I think I live in a state of active denial of my reality, um, and yet still very conscious of what I'm doing, you know, if that makes sense. And so that's the, the basic metaphor. Now, whether or not that will translate on the screen, I do not know. I really don't, but we're trying. I mean, I think that's just being a writer, right? It's like, you know, living in two different realities and trying to make unreal things come true and be real. Um, yeah, I mean, I came to your work through How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe, which, if anybody hasn't read that book, it's fantastic. It's really funny and melancholy and sci-fi. Um, so yeah, I guess I'd come to expect a kind of like slipperiness of reality from your work. Um, yeah, so I, I read the, the screenplay sections as just being like real somehow. Mm -hmm. like, you know, he, he lives on a film set, basically, and an interior film set. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 It is, it's as if reality is a show. 
term. That's the, probably the shortest way to put it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks for uh, both of you being up there. And um, I don't know if either of you have played with uh, ChatGPT from uh, OpenAI or um, Bard with, uh, with Google. So I start plugging in uh, and ask, can you write four or five opening paragraphs to a newly imagined novel using the writing style of Emily St. John Mandel? So okay. Was it good? Mm -hmm. Well, what struck me was that it's, it's the beginning of a simulation that now it's like the high schooler writing like a uh, sea of tranquility. It's about uh, a sea and people are tranquil. You know, so, so I got this sense of, one, that there's guardrails after the whole interchange with the New York Times writer where AI is saying, hey, you know, divorce your wife and let's mm -hmm. run away type thing. So are you alarmed or excited about this prospect of a s simulation of Emily St. John Mandel using the body of your works, which now it's just skimming, but if it had the full digestion where you write so artfully about simulation that that's where AI could live is in the spaces of your expression and have a very interesting incarnation. I just don't know. I don't know whether to be nervous or excited or neutral on it. Um, I did play around with chat GPT, but I was trying to trick it, to be honest. I wasn't doing it for any uh, good purposes. Um, we tripped it up really quickly. I, I asked it about, um, I think, yeah, I asked it to describe Sea of Tranquility. And it told me that Sea of Tranquility was initially published in 2010 and then republished in 2013 under the title Last Night in Montreal. <laughs> so it was just like, which was published in 2009 and only ever had that title. Um, so yeah, my experience of it was just a like, very confident delivery of wrong information. Um, so to your point, like a high schooler, probably, you know, in a creative writing class. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know whether to be apprehensive or just curious about it. Hi, uh, Emily. I'd like to thank you for the most uplifting post-apocalyptic fiction I've ever read. <laughs> um, it's it's a it really was a pleasure and uplifting. Thank you. Um, and I was I was struck while reading this book by a superficial similarity with Cloud Atlas. Did, did that, was that just parallel um, evolution slash um, uh, coincidence? Uh, no, I saw this book as an homage to Cloud Atlas in many ways, which is, um, yeah, Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell is one of my very favorite novels. And I think what will be obvious to anybody who reads both books is that I borrowed the Cloud Atlas structure for Sea of Tranquility. The content of the books is completely different, but Something I really admired about Cloud Atlas, still admire about Cloud Atlas, is this incredible structure that moves symmetrically from the far past. It's been a few years, but I want to say that book opens in like 1625 or something, like way back, and then moves way into the future and then back again. Um, I tried to do it with the Glass Hotel. I was fascinated by the structure. I absolutely could not make it work. Um, the only way I could make that structure work was by, um, by inserting the time traveler. So that even though it's moving forward and then backing in, backward in time, I do have the arc of this one character. Um, yeah, I don't know how Mitchell pulled it off without that. That was really incredibly difficult. I tried twice. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I truly love that book. Thank you. This is thrilling. I'm so excited to ask this question. OK, it's not a question about writing. It is a question about reading. Um, I was in a big reading slump this year. Uh, both of your books have come into my lives at, at, at very interesting times. I think books come into your life at the time that you're supposed to read them. But anyway, my question is, what is the last book you read that really got you out of a reading slump, assuming that you have reading slumps just like everyone else who reads? <laughs> um. Yeah, I absolutely have reading slumps. I read a novel called Vladimir recently by, can somebody tell me, it's Julia May blank Jones, I think so, Julia May Jones. Um, I love that book. Yeah, that, I think that was the book that most recently jolted me out of a reading slump. I don't read books anymore, I just <laughs> read scripts. Um, 
I don't I know that you can show run and read books. Yeah. It's kind of my understanding <laughs> of the job. Yeah, I I don't. But uh, I read Stay True, uh, which was quite good. Um, and I don't know if I was in a slump, but I guess it's it's a slump in that I wasn't reading much, but I was quite moving. We have time for one more question. No pressure being the last one. <laughs> um, I just had a question. I, I I really love that you know your style of switching obviously perspectives in in this in this novel, jumping through major time jumps as well and back. Um, just from a crafting perspective, as you write, was there an era or perspective that came to you first, or was very natural and easy to inhabit, and then the reverse? What was like very difficult or came to you late and kind of helped fill in the story just just as you were there writing? Uh, the thing that, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the thing that came in really late that I think was necessary for the story, I'm going to try to say this in a non-spoiler way, but um, the, no, I don't know if I can say it in a non-spoiler way. Okay. Uh, Gaspari's final job after he's a time agent. Um, that was something that came really, really late. As in, I thought the book was finished. I was about to send it to my agent. And I was like, wait, what if I did this and then that and then this? That would tie the whole thing together. So that was, yeah, that was kind of the final thing that filled it in. Um, in terms of what was easiest and hardest or most or least natural to write, I find historical fiction very difficult. This is the first time I'd ever tried it in the 1912 sections. And it's just, uh, it's just very research intensive in a way that other kinds of fiction are not. Um, the easiest fiction for me is the far future. You know, the further you go into the future, the more you're just making stuff up. <laughs> and that's, that's really, really fun. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you for being here. Thanks, thank everyone. you so much. Thank Such you. a pleasure. Thank you, thank you both. Emily will be signing, and both of your books are on sale, so you both can sign, if you will, um, so they will be in the lobby signing books. Thank you so much.